So I have the pleasure of introducing our next speaker, Dr. Nick Gabler. Dr. Gabler's research program can be divided into four areas, understanding the physiology and molecular pathways that define feed efficiency, differences in swine, gastrointestinal physiology, including integrity and function, the use of pigs as a biomedical model or dual purpose research for livestock and human application, and understanding the impact of disease and poor health on metabolism, nutrient requirements, feed intake, and tissue accretion in pigs. Please help me in welcoming Dr. Gabler. All right, thank you, Sarah, for the introduction, and thank you, everyone, for being here in the last uh, talk of the day. Really appreciate it. Um, there's a lot of good research going on at Iowa State, um, so thank you for being in this session just to hear a kind of a very short cross-section of what gets done. But um, today I'm going to talk about a project that um, was part of Kayla Miller's master's thesis to do with actual, what to do with feed, um, feed management if we can't um, move feed trucks around. And I'll set this up in a minute. But really, you're very well aware as you work in the pork industry, it's become very integrated. It's, highly, it's become more highly efficient than what it was back in the 60s and 70s and even into the early 80s. Probably in the late 90s, it became much more integrated. There's improved management practices. There's a lot more vertical integration, still not to the same extent as the poultry industry, but it's still very much vertically integrated. And then with this increased um, efficiencies, there's also, to, and movements towards consolidation, it also leads to, to some constraining factors. There's increased financial risk, there's agricultural policies that are all impacting the way that pigs are being produced, there's technology, there's management skills, there's public concern over how we raise animals, both from a feeding input standpoint, as well as from a welfare standpoint. And then at the end of the, end of the day, the reason why the industry has been consolidating is not just due to financial um, considerations, but it's also due to increased sustainability in the sense of environmental footprint, because to produce a pound of pork today takes less carbon and energy input than what it did 30, 40 years ago. And so with this increased integration, the swine industry has become more vulnerable. And then in recent years, we've been seeing this vulnerability. Uh, if you just go back uh, about 12 months ago, we had cyber attacks that knocked out a few JBS plants, both in the US and also in Australia, that shut them down for a few days because they'll held at ransom. We also have labor shortages that are actually threatening certain stages of production. You could argue the labor sh shortages were really um, exacerbated during COVID because the reason why the packing plant slowdown occurred was because the lack of people to actually be in the plant to actually harvest the pigs. We also see this currently in Europe right now with Brexit. The English can't get enough Euro Eastern European workers coming across to actually run their packing plants. And so therefore that's caused now a bottleneck in a situation where they can't actually move their pigs and actually um, harvest them for pork production. And so labor is a critical aspect within this and it's a highly um, vulnerable area. And then foreign animal disease. We're fortunate enough right now, we don't have any major foreign animal diseases, but they're on our doorstep in Central America. Um, and this could actually have a big impact on, on our supply chain. And again, look, we all aware of this back in 2020 with COVID-19, we had a big um, impact on the capacity of our packing plants to actually slaughter pigs. So by about March, April, we saw a big decline in the capacity and also the number of pigs slaughtered. And then everyone was aware of what happened is um, really there's pigs that had to get humanely euthanized. Also, there was a whole lot of research that was done across the country just to quickly figure out how we can slow down pigs. And so really if we talk about some of that research is we, we at Iowa State were some of the first, we thought ahead and said, right, well how can we provide the information to the industry to how we can manage these pigs if we have to slow them down. And so Emma Helm did some work both at, within Iowa State and also in collaboration with New Fashion Pork and we really tried to get this information disseminated out really quickly to the industry about how we can actually better manage growth of these pigs under this situation of when we can't actually move them. And so one of the things that we looked at, and I'm not gonna go into too much detail with this slide, but really 
we showed that using a high acidic diet of calcium chloride, we can actually slow down pig growth dramatically, virtually hold them to a standstill, both whether it's under individual pig rearing conditions or in the group pen conditions. We also showed that we we'll, are we'll one of the first groups to really propose, well, let's just do a simple essential amino acid deficiency. Let's just feed them 97% corn. Because one of the things that um, I was talking to some producers back in February of that year is, well, what if we just pull all the bean meal out and synthetic amino acids out and leave everything else in? What type of diet do we end up with? It turned out to be roughly 97% of a, of a ground corn diet. But can we use that type of diet to create a very simple, cost-effective amino acid deficiency, an essential, essential amino acid deficiency, to slow the growth rates down. And as you can see from, from this, we were able to slow pig growth down for multiple weeks. And then we also looked at using fiber, which to a less extent, feeding 15 to 20% NDF diets, they did have an impact on growth, but it wasn't as dramatic as what we probably really needed. And so the industry adopted some of this stuff instantaneously. They also worked with using temperature, increased temperature within barns to actually help maintain pig viability. In other words, they could keep pigs alive for longer till the packing plant situation resolved itself. And fortunately, it actually did. So really, that got us thinking is this whole period back in 2020 showed us that you know, we can be pretty nimble on our feet if we don't let our egos and politics get in the way of actually waiting for money to come to actually do research. But then also, what does the industry need next, and how can we just be better prepared for what may be coming in the future? And so, just talking with Jason Ross and a couple other people at the pork industry, Iowa Pork Industry Centre, one thing that kept coming up with was a foreign animal disease outbreak. There's a whole lot of work, there's another seminar session going on about foreign animal disease preparedness, but one of the things that struck us is, is that the state vets have the authority to stop any truck movements if they wish to in a certain geographic region if there was a foreign animal disease detected there. And so what if they pulled the trigger and said, right, in Hamilton County where I live in Iowa, what if they can't move trucks in or out to move pigs out or actually bring feed in? How do we manage what's there? And so one of the questions you know, that we want to work out is, well, what would the industry do? Are they even aware of that? Because half the people we talk to aren't aware of the fact that there could be a transport limitation ban within a certain region of this. But then what if you've got pigs already on feed within that region? How do you manage them? What are the, what are the scenarios or situations that we can do to actually help those pigs if they're still clean pigs, they're not infected with the actual disease or pathogen? But how do we manage them? And so, instead of looking at slowing growth, we propose the question here is, how can we manage the feed on hand? Because depending on the timing of it, you might have bins that are virtually empty. You might have 10 or 20 tonne of feed on hand. You, don't, you could be in any different scenario within the timing of when your feed, next set of feed gets delivered. And you could also have, a, this work also could have application to the fact that if a if a feed mill burnt down within a region, or a cyber attack kind of screwed up a few feed mills within a certain region, it's gonna slow down the ability just logistically to organize how to get feed to all the pigs in that region. So therefore, there's gonna be periods that we may have to be prepared for that we have to manage the feed on hand, but then how can we best do that? And so, really, Part of it is slowing growth, but this focus of this, unlike it was with COVID-19 response, is how can we manage feed budgets? How can we manage the feed that we have there? And then if the only option is, if you can't bring anything in, then can we find anything local? So what would be a local aspect that we could actually use to feed pigs? So therefore, we collaborated with United Animal Health in Indiana to help do this. We were just discussing some of these ideas with them and they offered up their research facilities. And so in collaboration with United Animal Health, we came up with this objective. We want to evaluate feed and feeder management strategies to maintain growth performance and carcass composition in commercially housed pigs. In other words, we want to deal with pigs that we're gonna have, uh, we have 20, 22 pigs per pen not just a small university scale, but under kind of more of a commercial stocking rate. 
But then more importantly, if we're talking about feed management, one of the biggest questions people always ask, well, if you don't have group pen pigs actually have feed in front of them, are they going to turn on each other? So therefore, what is the impact of these, of any strategy would be on pig behavior and also welfare or well-being? And so we kind of came up with the two-pronged approach where we wanted to say, well, how can we manage the feed to so the performance aspect, but also what is, and the carcass aspect of, of that implementation strategy, but also what does those strategies do to pig welfare and pig behavior? So the last thing we want is to go around the country and say, oh, we recommend strategy X, Y, or Z, but then there's increased cannibalism or other things going on that's some negative behaviors. And so our two objectives were to assess these aspects. So our general design of the project is that we had fought about 1,400 pigs, they were DNA genetics, they started off at around 92 kilograms body weight. They were, we had 12 um, pens per treatment and we had 20 to, 22 to 24 pigs per pen. And so we tried to get an industry kind of relevant stocking rate and also stocking density within each pen. And this project was divided up into two periods over a three-week test period. So we had period one, which was a first 14-day period, where we actually implemented a feed management strategy. And then we had a seven-day, uh, sorry, a seven-day period two, where all pigs were put back onto ad libitum or onto normal feeding conditions. Because the other thing was, is, okay, well, once we can liberate the, any feeding management strategy, What's the response to that? How are they going to rebound? And really, for no rhyme or reason, Kayla Miller and myself and Jason Ross, we decided to go with 14 days in the sense that we figured logistically, the time people figure out there's a problem, the time the government gets involved, it's going to take a little bit to sort itself out. So we thought, well, let's just go for 14 days. So we could, go to, we could have gone for three days to meet, meet the 72 hours, we could have gone for seven days, but we said, well, let's push it a little bit to 14 days because we felt that would give us a little bit more coverage of some of the extreme aspects if we had to go that long. And it may take longer than 14 days to figure out some of this biosecurity aspect depending on if there was a foreign animal disease spread, yeah, how far is it migrating around that region and then, how, and then what the flow is. So our treatment strategies are here. We really had three different strategies and we divided up into five different treatment groups. But the first strategy was just keep pigs on ad libitum feed, which is about three X of maintenance. And so our second strategy was, well, can we come up with a way to actually feed pigs based on a maintenance requirement? And so we used a maintenance strategy and I'll get to that in a minute. But we did a 1.45 times um, maintenance requirement and a 2x times maintenance requirement. So that was our kind of maintenance calculator. So and I'll explain that one in a minute. The other strategy was to use just closed feeders. And I think Kansas State and other groups showed that you can shut the feeders down quite effectively to stretch feed out. And so we thought that's a practical way that you could actually stretch feed already. There is other strategies that we, that we could have looked at, like heat stress and other, other um, putting calcium chloride through the water lines or, in the, um, or do some other water strategies, but we thought we'll just stick with the feed stuff right now if the idea we couldn't bring anything else in. Except we decided to also go with a whole corn kernel diet. If you drive around Iowa, you look at all the grow finish barns, Normally on every, probably every five square miles, at least some farm is going to have a grain bin full of corn. And we thought, well, it's a geographic lockdown if it is going to come into place. So someone could easily go with a pickup truck, go pick up some bags of whole corn, and actually bring that to the barn to actually hold pigs. The other thing we also thought about but we didn't get into was actually using corn stovers or some sort of hay. But then this is a over slats and then we didn't want to deal with the actual pit management aspect. But that's another strategy that could have, we could have also, or we discussed, but we thought we better not go there. So really these are our five strategies, was ad lib feeding, maintenance feeding at two different levels, close feeders and whole corn, um, a whole corn, unground whole corn kernels. So there's no vitamins and minerals, it's literally just straight corn. So, Really, our control ad lib treatment, as I said, it's just typically whatever the pigs wanted to eat, the feeders were left full, they were offered unrestricted, a diet that just met or exceeded their requirements, 
They're just a standard corn soy-based diet. I'll get into that in a second. Our second kind of overall strategy was maintenance feeding. And so what we did, we just used the NRC calculation of 197 times body weight to the 0.6 on the average body weight of that pen. And then from that, um, from that, then we calculated how much energy that average pig would actually need to consume to maintain its maintenance. In other words, just maintain its static body weight. Then we multiplied that literally by the amount of pigs in the pen. And then we, by knowing the energy level of the diet, we can work out how many pounds or kilograms of feed that we would have to offer that pen. And then we decided to offer it at either 1.45 or 2x. We thought we might go to 1x, but not knowing what to expect, and we, and we didn't want to have any um, animal ethics ICAC issues, we decided, well, 1.45 is probably going to give us a good low maintenance level. And so we offered the pig. So these, this here would have been, um, what, 70 pounds a day into, the, into a pen, would have been for about the 1.45 um, kilograms we offered to 22 pigs, to give you a rough idea. So in other words, probably two bags of feed a day would be equated. So we figured also using this, these type of numbers would be equivalent to either bringing sacks of feed in or someone had a couple of five gallon pails, they could literally just load them up and then just dump them. And the idea was that we could easily, I and mean, we'll be doing this over the next probably six months, we'll develop a calculator that someone could easily just go calculate out how much maintenance, or how much feed they need to offer a pen at any different level of maintenance. They can put in the number of pigs, the energy level of their diet, how many, um, and also do they want 1x, 1.4, whatever number they want. And so it'd be an easy calculator for someone to adapt or adopt. The other thing is, if we, if we went with this strategy, the typical feeding system would go, let's, it fills up the first feeder, goes to the next feeder, and then when that's full, it goes to the next one. But then you may run out of feed by the time that feeding system went all the way through that barn. And so we wanted to try and get it across the whole barn. The other strategy is a closed feeder. You can see here the feeders were clamped down as, as tight as we could get them. Um, and that was done daily because they do move over time with the pigs just nosing at them and moving around. So you can see the pans here are pretty empty. But again, this is a very easy, easy strategy to help stretch feed out. Also, I think part of the philosophy with this strategy is that pigs will have to work for it, therefore they're kind of entertained to some extent, trying to play with getting to the feed. And then our last strategy, you can see, I don't know, it might be hard to see up here, but these are the whole corn kernels in the, in the feeder here. So in other words, it wasn't a complete diet, it was just corn, straight corn kernels put in, unground straight corn kernels. And that was offered at Libidum. So our diets, as I said, it's just a, it was a corn distiller's soybean meal based diet, nothing fancy, just a, we'll call it a traditional, typical Midwest diet. But the, the biggest thing is, is that the SID um, lysine to ME was very different just with the corn because it's an amino acid deficient diet. And it's also deficient in other things. And so, and this is a little bit different than what the 97% corn based diet that we use for slowing pig growth down because this is unprocessed whole corn, no vitamins and minerals or anything. This is just corn only. And so what we did, uh, or what Kayla did, because I was teaching class, um, what she did over in Indiana, they weighed pigs individually on day zero, all 1,400 pigs individually on day zero and also on day 14 of the study, and again at day 21. So Start of period one, the end of period one, and then the end of period two. And we did individual body weights because one thing that we were really interested in was variation. How much variability will we see within the pig? Because we can easily calculate out the average, but then the average could be that the alpha pig or the dominant pigs could be eating everything and then the bottom end virtually get nothing, but the average is gonna be about the same if you look at it. So we want to see how, you know, what's the impact on variability. Because if we're trying to hold pigs till we can move them, we don't want to really have a huge degree of variation within these pigs. Um, we also, outside the traditional measures of, of growth performance, we'll call it, and feed intake, feed efficiency, we also, um, Kayla did daily observations. So, she, so we had one person walk through every single pen every day and actually kind of grade the pig on a PQA-based um, assessment for, on, on a rubric for welfare 
based on tail bites, side bites, um, uh, scratches, etc., the wounding, and, and so forth. Pretty much a QPA, or sorry, PQA-based rubric system. And we thought, well, that's already widely available to everyone, and so therefore it's a language that we didn't have to reinvent ourselves. And so we looked at all that, and then we just came up today, and we're only going to present the total kind of aggressions or total abrasions. And then we also looked at mortalities, removals, if, it, if there were any on this. And again, the, for um, behavioral assessment, tail bites with visible, visible lesions, open flesh wounds, um, sores, side bites, circular wounds were, were assessed, scratches, kind of just eyeballing length. So it was a common rubric used every day to kind of get a crude indicator of pig behavior. So without putting kind of video cameras and actually going back and really looking at them, we just tried to come up with some sort of measure that any caretaker could walk through and say, right, yeah, this is a sign of increased aggression or increased um, uh, welfare concerns. And then the severity of lesions were, were summed up and then we expressed it as a percentage of pigs present with these lesions in the pen. And we'll get into that a little bit. Um, pen was our experimental unit for everything here. Um, and then again, we just used a main effect of treatment, so the five different treatments. We had a random effect of rep, and then the, as again, pen was our experimental unit. So really, the first thing that we'll after, our main objective was feed intake. And so we'll present that one first. So average daily feed intake in these pigs. And this is period one, so for the first 14 days when these five strategies were used, we can see that you know, by design, because we're feeding pigs on a maintenance requirement, we had our 1.45 times maintenance pigs had about a 56% reduction in average daily feed intake compared to the ad-lib control. So the same diet, but just restrict fed. And we kind of, you know, we forced this to be that level of intake. And these pigs cleaned up everything in the feeder every day. Because what feed was dropped twice a, twice a day, or once a day, feed was dropped only once a day for these pigs. And then the 2x maintenance, there was about a 41% reduction in average daily feed intake. The closed feeders was about a 22% reduction. And that was quite similar to what people have reported during the COVID shutdown when they used closed feeders. And then the whole corn was about a 25% reduction. So one strategy that someone could employ based on this is that you could go whole corn and closed feeders. We didn't, we didn't do that combination and that might be an additive or it could be the same one, we don't know. But that's an that's a, a opportunity to actually stretch feed out over the, this two week period. Now again, the type of strategy that you use is also going to be dependent on how much feed you have on hand. So that's the calculation you're going to have to do before you pick a strategy. But on the rebound, so in period two, after these pigs kind of were put back onto ad libitum full feed, so all back onto the same corn soy distillers diet, we can see that there was a, a slight increase, a seven to eight percent increase in feed intake. And again, this is kind of partially into this compensatory gain aspect, and maybe also just increase, um, the just an increased metabolic state is allowing them just to eat more because they're trying to eat to their energy needs. And with a heavier pig, they want more energy because there's more calories to maintain, therefore by default they're going to eat more. And then overall, if we took a look at it over a 21-day kind of experimental period, we really see the same thing. There's about a 38%, but a lot of gain. All this is really driven by that period one. So these are kind of, if we're talking about manage, managing the feed and stretching feed out, all of these strategies work to some degree to actually stretch feed out that's on hand. And then it just depends on how long you have to stretch your feed out depending on which strategy you're going to use. But then looking at um, average daily gain over this first two week period where we actually implemented these five strategies, there was about a 98% reduction in, with the 1.5x, so in other words, that was pretty darn, if, if you look at maintenance requirements, that's pretty darn close to maintenance on average. But again, I think there's some pigs here that probably are overeating their maintenance requirement, and there's some pigs that are well under their maintenance requirement that, that we get to this number. So if we went for, one, if we went for a, like a 1x, which is kind of true maintenance requirement, they're probably going to lose weight 
on a group pen situation would be my estimation on this. And then there was about a 69% yeah, reduction in average daily gain with the um, 2x maintenance and then also with the whole corn. And the whole corn or the yellow bar here is really just the amino acid deficiency. So we're limiting essential amino acids is probably the main, and is the main driving factor because energy levels are about the same. It's the amino acid aspect. Again, like we saw with our COVID-19 response data, there was a significant rebound with regard to growth performance in the week after we liberated that restriction. And again, I'm still debating to myself whether this increase in average daily gain, how much of it is actually gut fill, how much of it is actually increased water retention within the carcass. There's lots of factors, because I don't think it's all just lean tissue. But then there's studies really need to kind of look at what that gain is and how truly compensatory it is over a longer period of time. This is only one week prior to, they went, prior to these pigs getting marketed. But there was about a 56% increase, about a, anywhere from a 30 to 46% increase in average daily gain as we responded. But as you notice that the response in growth rates is higher, the more severe they were, were restricted in that first period. So that would indicate to me there's some increased efficiency, metabolic efficiencies going on, but also I think a lot of it's just gut fill capacity is just really increased, and that's what we're seeing with this average daily gain. And then again, overall, we resulted anywhere from a, almost a 50% reduction in average daily gain over the 21-day test period, down to about a 14% with the closed feeders. If we go to feed efficiency, looking at, um, looking at this, as expected in period one, our feed efficiency is bad with any of these strategies because again, we're trying to hold feed here. We're not, we're not really caring about the efficiency of gain. We just want to, can we stretch feed over? And then either of these strategies isn't good. But then in period two, what we see is actually an incre a, a increase in feed efficiency. And I, and I believe from a lot of the um, residual feed intake work we did 10 years ago, a lot of this is that these pigs over two weeks have lowered their metabolic set point. Therefore, there's a lower maintenance, a lower kind of energy requirement to maintain their bodily functions. And then there's a metabolic efficiency that's been gained, and that's what we're seeing here. And that's what help translates to the increase in, in growth performance. But if you look at just kind of flat out body weights, all these pigs, as we said, start off around 92 kilograms. Over 14 days of restriction, the control pigs got up to about 107 kilograms. Our 1.4x pigs were really just maintained, like a truly at no gain at all overall. And then at 2x, there was about a, um, about a five kilogram gain over that 14 day period. And then with the corn, it was actually it was only about a, um, a, six a six kilogram gain over the period. But really what we're interested in is what was the variability? And so Kayla looked at the standard deviations within each group. And then probably the better way to look at it is looking at the percentage of change of standard deviation of the body weight. So that's really the take home message is the more severe we restricted the pigs, we increased the variability of the body weights. And that makes total sense, especially with the, strategy that we, the strategies that we employed. So one thing that we do have to watch out for is that if you do implement any of these strategies, you are going to get increased variability because you've got some pigs that are probably going to be eating a lot more, some pigs are going to be eating a lot less, and this whole hierarchical social structure it really explains probably this variability, and that's where the, the welfare behaviorists can get in there and kind of would figure this out. But on the um, carcass composition, overall, the whole corn diet decreased lean percentage and loin depth. The restrict feed treatments reduced um, fat and loin depth, as expected. And then on the closed feeders, was going to be it was similar to the control, with regard to some of the plant carcass data that was collected at Logan Sport at, Ty at Tyson's. Here. So one of the questions that we we always, or one of the original objectives or questions was, what was the impact on the behavior? And um, we're not gonna call it behavioral vices, whatever, we always get in trouble if we mention behavioral vices, but really, what is going on with regard to aggression? And just for simplicity terms, I'm only gonna show um, Kayla's data here that really just looked at total abrasions, because there was some slight differences with 
with head, um, with, with head and, and tail biting and ear biting and side scratches and so forth. But really what you can see here is, is that the more severe the restriction is, the percentage of pigs within that pen had more total abrasions, which is a crude indicator of increased aggression. And that increased aggression could simply have been competition for the feeder space. In other words, if we've got one pig in there, another pig's going to come in beside it and kind of nudge it away or, or kind of bite on it to move it out the way if it wants to feed. And that's probably what we're seeing here, particularly with the, with the 1.45x and 2x treatments, so the green and blue, there's just a higher percentage of pigs that uh, um, had more abrasions on them. And you would 100% expect that. And so really the take-home message from this, from a behaviour standpoint, is if you are going to implement these strategies, we've really got to consider welfare. Now we didn't have any, any major issues with, or any major removals with regard to tail bites or prolapses or, or excess wounding or anything like that, or any, more, any major mortalities outside of normal with any of these strategies. So everything worked here, in a sense, but without having a lot of removals. But it is something we need to consider. So really, one thing, this, I'll just conclude from this part of the, of, the, of the talk, is extending feed budgets is achievable with any of the strategies that we used, especially with main, uh, stretching out feed based on a maintenance requirement. And one thing I'm going to stress, any of these strategies that you're going to choose, or hopefully you don't have to choose, but if we had to choose, is really going to depend on how much feed you have on hand and what's your availability to get, and how fast you can get new feed here. And so, compared to the ad-lib, all strategies also had an impact on average daily gain. There were some differences in carcass composition over the 14 or 21 day period. And then there's competition for feed, we believe has increased the skin lesions or total abrasions on these pigs. And so if you're gonna adopt any of these strategies, you also gotta make sure that you balance the welfare consideration. Because the last thing the industry needs is for the, gen for the New York Post or Times or one of those Washington Post, one of those newspapers to say, well, people aren't, Iowa farmers aren't feeding their pigs, and then there's increased welfare concerns. And so we've got to manage these strategies with the pig, and then hopefully we don't have to just go math euthanasia on these pigs, because we can stretch the feed budgets until we can figure out how to move feed. So strategies are achieved to slow pigs and to extend feed budgets are available. Um, given the resources available, certain management strategies need to be, kept, uh, need to be considered. But the other thing we need to consider with, if we are going to restrict feed or do feeding on a maintenance basis is what's the impact on gastric ulcers? And so based on this research, working with Wes Schreer and Omar Mendoza at the Mashals, we thought, well, how is this feeding regime? Does it have an impact on ulcerations? We're dropping feed once a day we're restrict feeding these pigs, they're under increased stress. And so we don't want to go around the country saying, oh, these strategies work, and then all of a sudden we have a whole lot of ulcerations, and they're going to say, oh, Iowa State, you didn't know anything about that. Why didn't you tell us? So we wanted to go and look at, well, we know off-feed events can actually increase gastric ulcers. We know that increased stress can increase gastric ulcers, particularly in growth-finished pigs. And so what we want to know was, if we implement any of these strategies, do we get increased ulcerations? And so we then did a follow-up study, we've done two follow-up studies along the similar um, trend where we actually implemented this disease feed intake feeding pattern. And so what we did, based off a lot of our PERS research we've done over the last few years, this is the typical feed intake, I'd say in the red here, of what a PERS-infected pig actually eats based on maintenance requirements over a 14-day period. There's, within the first couple of days, feeding take dramatically drops, they go off feed. Then over time, as the disease progresses, it gets worse, it drops below maintenance, they might maintain or lose body weight, and then over time, as they clear the virus, they increase. So this is very similar to um, what we saw with regard to just feeding at 1.45x. So we decided, well, let's just go with a 1x, roughly a 1.1x and a 2x feeding regime, and then does that increase the incidence rates of ulcers? We also did this under pallet diets that are either um, finely ground corn at 350 microns or coarsely ground corn, which is about 750 microns. 
because in the industry there's a big variety of whether th whether the th diet's palated or whether the actual um, the micron size of the corn grind. Some people are down to 350 because they want the feed efficiency benefits. Some people could be up at 750 or even higher. And so we just did a um, a 42-day study where we looked at this. I'm going to skip over this stuff and I'm going to go just to the alterations. So this is on a score. We we scored these pigs on a on a um, pretty much a zero to, to three scale on severity with regard to ulcerations. This is fine or coarse ground corn, palleted. And you can see here, here's some pictures of our pigs. This was a three here. You can see this nice ulcer, typical ulcer around the paths of esophageal region in these pigs after, after 14 days on this restrict feeding protocol. Where up the top here is a relatively normal pig. Sorry, where are we? Where's one? up here is a relatively normal pig. And so just restrict feeding, whether it's even at 2x or 1x, we're increasing the risk of ulcerations irrespective of particle size in these pigs when we look at just gross examination in the part of esophageal. If you look at hyperkeratinosis, another indicator of kind of gastric stress, we can see that there's more um, keratin being deposited around the part of esophageal region here less up here in these pegs, and again, as the feed restriction increases, we see an increased risk of hyperkeratinosis. The other thing that we looked at was just the body of the pig, um, of the stomach, I should say. And one thing that's often underreported is what's happening to the stomach body with regard to um, ulcerations. And here you can see is that there's no difference in the score, but the score's all up. They're all scoring at least one or higher with regard to ulcerations of the stomach lining. And so it's hard to see up here, but you can see this red splotchiness here. You can see a nice kind of localized lesion here within the body. Here's a little bit more spread out. But what we seem to, seem to see with these normal pigs, irrespective of feeding, is that we do have an, a higher degree of just kind of ulcerations in the body of the stomach that we can grossly see. Now, we don't know how normal this actually is. I think this is relatively normal for the industry, but then you, what significance does this have actually on pig health and also on gastric function? And so really just to, really just to finish up here due to time, the point with the ulceration stuff is that we have mild to moderate ulcerations that we see if we do feed pigs close to maintenance or 2x maintenance irrespective of whether on a fine or coarse feed. So if we do implement a strategy where we are actually restrict feeding, feeding pigs on a maintenance requirement, there is a potential to increase the risk of ulcerations in these pigs. And so a lot of the times is that these ulcerations are also not just exclusive to the pars esophageal region. We see them in the body. Actually, we see more body ulcerations than what we do in just in the traditional pars region. And so monitoring feed intake is going to be critical, but also feed restriction does increase the risk. And on a side note, this could have implications for actually how we feed gestating sows. Because if you think we're just dropping limited or limit feeding gestating sows, dropping feed once a day or maybe twice a day, are we increasing the risk of ulcerations in those pigs? So really, to finish up, overall, either of these, these strategies can limit feed intake with varying degrees of success in this size pig. So these are market weight pigs, up around 220 pounds. We can have an impact on growth rates. More importantly, we can stretch feed budgets out. We are having an impact on aggression, the more restricted we feed these pigs. And then also there is some gastric physiology considerations that we have to do. And so with that, um, I'd like to thank Eric Burrow at the vet school for helping us do a lot of the diagnostics work, at least on looking at the microscopic lesions, which we didn't get into. Uh, Wes Schweer here from Zimpro, and also Caleb Mendoza for, uh, sorry, um, um, Caleb Scholl and, and Omar Mendoza at the Mashrofs for helping with some of the diet aspects of this, and then my lab group for helping Kayla and I actually implement all of this work. And with that, I'd be happy to take any questions. Okay, we have time for one quick question. I'm just gonna go here because she's closer, sorry. Um, it looked like with the abrasions, you saw that they went up, but then on day 21, it looked like they 
drop like a rock, right? Yep. Is that the implication that once they were able to, that's when they could it's feed a, again yeah, normally? It's a sati I think it's a satiation effect. And so, yeah, once they're back on full feed, they didn't they're happy care, again. They're happy again. Not unlike humans, I suppose. And I think, right? Kayla, you can speak to how fast that really occurred, but it was pretty quick. So those uh, those types of it wasn't a learned thing in any way, any rate, any way, shape, or form. They didn't continue any of those kind of aggressive behaviors once they'd done them. They once they were fed, they seemed to be pretty happy pigs. It sounds like. Yeah. So our interpretation of the data is it's purely to do with competition at the feeder. Okay. Would be the probably the better way to explain it. Okay, so it is 4.30 and I want to just do a few housekeeping items that there is going to be barbecue and beer outside where we had lunch that's going to be hosted by AB Vista, Tech Mix, and Lunch. So I am going to end the session there, but if you have questions for Dr. Gabler, would you mind sticking around for a few yeah. minutes to answer those? So let's give Dr. Gabler another round of applause. <laughs> and if you need to get going, thank yep. you guys. Dan? Um, one thing that, I may not that yeah, I was about to say politely yeah, that we have um, institutional bureaucracy we have to get through, <laughs> so that was probably, um, that would have been pushing it, especially in group pen, so we thought, well, let's just go at a comfort level that we thought we could at least not have a, a train wreck of the situation, so that's why we just chose a 1.45. I understand why you did it. Yeah. But it would, yeah, it would be interesting to do every other day or every every three if days. we have an event where we're 72 hours and you have to have a barn that's already out of feed and you can't get a truck there, those yes. things are going to be out of feed. Yeah. That's so right. Something happens. But that's why... be out of feed for a day or two before you get... Yes. And so that's why we saw it. Well, the contractor or whoever's looking after the pigs could at least go locally and get a couple of bags of corn or a couple of fill up some five gallon pails and load up a pickup truck and still be within the quarantine zone and that would be a practical way just to throw a couple of buckets into a feeder just to hold them over. So yeah. You know, as humans, if we fast for more than a day or two, it gets kind of uncomfortable, but we can certainly make it. Yeah, but I think that could be a strategy that works. And I think people tried that, I think during the slow growth period, they actually didn't feed pigs for a few days. So. And there are some, I mean, anecdotal stories that some, some situations have worked well and there's increased kind of bite, tail bite and aggression was also reported, anecdotally. It's going to be it, it's going to be storage capacity on the barns, and also the um, also the timing of when the feed mill will come around to fill them up again. The norm would be what are, are most operations getting feed every other day or every day or every couple of days? It would be every depending on the size of the bins. It could be every couple of weeks. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Flexibility. But, it's, but you also, no one's going to know when this is going to happen. And so we could have, yeah, you might have been filled up with, you, you might have two weeks worth of feed on hand, or you might be literally, you only got enough for 24 hours. Yeah, you might be at the end of the highway. Yeah, you, you don't know. And so that's why we thought we'd come up with different strategies, because how much feed you have on hand is going to dictate which strategy or how aggressive your strategy is going to be. Well, that's why we went for 14 days. <laughs> <laughs> because of the, I mean, there's going to be bureaucracy, and then.
Yes. And then when they do hear about it, they hear the idea of 72 hours, and it doesn't really seem realistic. Yeah. Well, I mean, that, that was really the premise of this research. It said, right, well, at least we can put it out there. People right. will at least hopefully will be in their preparedness plans. And then there are some strategies rather than, oh, crap, we've got the problem. Now what do we do? Right. Yeah, like a lot of us did during COVID-19. So with that aspect. So we're hopefully we'll at least put some information out there and here's some potential strategies. But also there's some limitations or considerations that we need to, right. we need to balance up here, well, which is welfare. <laughs> Well, you look at the pol I mean, look at the poultry with the um, mm. um, avian influenza. They just literally euthanize every animal on site. That's a management plan. Would you explain what you meant by maintenance 1.45 and maintenance t uh, two? Uh, All right. So my mind is saying 145 percent of maintenance, the pigs will. Okay. So th typically speaking, a full ad lib fed animal pig is going to be eating about 2.8 to 3.2 times maintenance. That's ad libitum feeding. So if you calculate how much energy that pig has to consume each day, typically it's going to be 2.8 to 3.2 times its maintenance require, energy requirement is what they're going to consume. It's going to depend on how, on the genetics, but this kind of generally speaking is going to be 2.8 to 3.2 roughly. So you cut it down in half and you cut it by a third of the other. Correct. And we would have, we were originally would like to have gone, I mean, just for easy math, three, two, one. But our concern, if we go one, we don't want to have a train wreck and have um, get pulled um, pulled into our ICUT committee and then have the attending vet chew us out because of considerations. So therefore, we decided, well, what would be practical, and what was, uh, the other consideration was how what's the lowest amount of feed that we could kind of drop using the feeding system that would make sense because there was limitations there because it, it's a little bit difficult just to drop 20, I mean, 20 kilos of feed. can be done, but there's, there's more inaccuracies the lower you go. So that's why we just went with a 1.45 was kind of this welfare consideration in place as well as we felt there was enough feed on hand to actually help both not just the dominant pigs but also at least the, the non-alpha pigs they'll get something in their bellies, a little bit just to go and they're not gonna just lose weight. So we used the, cal the NRC calculation of 197 times body weight to the 0.6, and then that gives you kcals per pig, of, of how much energy that pig needs to have to maintain its body weight at a kind of a static body weight. And then you, if you know your kcals of your diet, then you can do some easy math and then work out, all right, well I need to, you know, 1.5 kilos was about was um, pretty close to maintenance requirements for that group of pigs. It probably would have been about one three, one two, if if it was truly at one instead of one point four. Okay. And then that's an easy calculation that someone could easily plug into a computer and say, or in just in a tablet or in a phone, or we could create a sliding scale. Say, right, I got twenty two pigs in this pen. I need to give it a minimum of seventy pounds or sixty pounds a day if I want to imp implement this strategy. So we're trying to keep this simple. All right, thank you everyone.